In the late 1880s, Louis Comfort Tiffany was given his first commission for a fully integrated church interior. This is a story of St. Hubert's Chapel. In the Ramapo Mountains and the northern portions of Morris County, New Jersey, lies a 130-acre lake that is steeped in history. From iron mining that supported early American farmers, to the country estate of one of the early industrial barons, to one of the earliest planned unit developments, this water body has seen and become history. In the early 1800s, the lake was purportedly created by Hubbard S. Stickle as part of an 800-acre tract of land he had amassed. The pond was historically known as Stickle Pond. Stickle operated a sawmill and later a forge on the outlet of the lake. Remnants of Stickle's forge can be seen today along the side of the Stonehouse Brook. In 1885, Francis Kinney began purchasing large tracts of land to form a gentleman's country estate. Over the years, Kinney eventually increased his land holdings to over 5,000 acres. At one point, he was the largest landowner in Morris County. Most of the land was located in what was then Pequannock Township. Kinney named his estate Kinney Lawn. Kinney primarily used his country estate as a hunting and fishing retreat. In 1885, Kinney changed the name of the pond to Lake Kinnelon. Francis Kinney was the second son of Mary Cogswell and Franklin Kinney. His father, Franklin, was a prominent attorney with many political connections. He was appointed as commissioner to the World's Fair in 1851. Franklin Kinney was a seventh generation direct descendant of William Bradford, who landed in New England on the Mayflower in 1620. Kinney's mother, Mary Cogswell Kinney, was the eldest daughter of Reverend Jonathan and Elizabeth Cogswell. Mary's uncle, Nathaniel Cogswell, was involved in early East Indies trade and became known as the King of the Caribbean. Nathaniel Cogswell had amassed great wealth. Upon his death in 1832, he left the bulk of his $200,000 estate, a fortune in those days, to his niece Mary and her three sisters. The Cogswells can trace their family ancestry back to Charlemagne. Francis Sherwood Kinney was born in New Brighton, Staten Island on October 16, 1839. Young Francis attended school in New Brunswick whence a restless disposition led him to go to sea. He served on several noted clipper ships and rose to become a mate. He then abandoned a seafaring life and turned his attention to railroads. Under the engagement with William Wheelwright, he built, as foreman, the first wharves and the first 10 miles of the Cordova Central Railroad. He then took command of an expedition to explore the upper waters of La Plata River, and after two years of hardship, appeared with a raft built of cedar logs at the head of steamboat navigation, having run the blockade of the Paraguayan War and demonstrated the possibility of rafting on the Uruguayan River. In 1869, Kinney engaged in the manufacture of tobacco at number 141 Broadway, New York, and founded the firm of Kinney Brothers Tobacco Company, later known as the Kinney Tobacco Company. In 1890, the Kinney Tobacco Company merged with several competitors, including an enterprise owned by James Buchanan Duke to form the American Tobacco Company. Francis Kinney married Mary Brady and together they had four children. Joel Kinney, Beatrice Kinney, Warren Kinney, and Morris Kinney. On the shore of Stickles Pond, Kinney erected a large home. Over the years, he enlarged the home to 84 rooms, four stories tall and about 20,000 square feet in size. The family called their country house, The Cottage. In addition to their country estate, the Kinneys also owned the home at 54th and Broadway in New York City and a summer home in Narragansett Pier, Rhode Island. 
Kinney constructed numerous other buildings to support his Kinalan estate, which included a kennel, cattle barn, bathhouse, gatehouse, superintendent's house, dairy, firehouse, and lookout tower. Most of these buildings were substantially constructed from stone and still survive in the smoke rise section of the Kinalan borough. Many of the buildings have been repurposed, but some still retain their original function. Kinney's wife, Mary Brady Kinney, was of the Catholic faith. The nearest Catholic church, St. Anthony's Monastery in nearby Butler, was a long, arduous carriage ride over seven miles away. As a token of his love and devotion to his wife, Kinney decided to erect a small chapel on his estate for Mary Kinney and their children. In the spring of 1886, Kinney laid out plans for the future chapel on a small island in the middle of Lake Kinnelon. It is unknown why Kinney chose the remote island location. Some speculate that he preferred a watery separation between church and state. Others speculate that the remote location was symbolic of the various churches St. Hubert established in the Belgian Ardennes. Construction of the chapel was conducted quietly and secretively. It took three years to complete a portion of the church major and clock tower. On the morning of October 25, 1889, the chapel was consecrated for use by the Right Reverend Wynan M. Wigger, Bishop of Newark, and placed under the patronage of St. Hubert. Hubert was a nobleman who was connected to the Roman court. He was a passionate hunter and had little interest in secular matters. The legend is told that one Good Friday, when the pious were attending church, Hubert took to the hunt. As he came upon a clearing in the forest, Hubert observed a large stag which displayed a shining crucifix between its antlers. The stag spoke to Hubert, urging that he give up his pagan lifestyle and seek out the true faith, lest he should fall into hell. After his strange encounter in the forest, Hubert sought out the advice of Bishop Lambert in Maastricht, who convinced Hubert to give up his worldly ways and take up Christianity. In 708, Bishop Lambert was murdered and Hubert was selected to succeed him. Later, Hubert moved the Episcopal See from Maastricht to Liège and established the church there about 720. He was the first bishop of Liège. During his Christian life, Hubert is credited with abolishing pagan worship and establishing Christianity in the remote areas of the Ardennes. Hubert died on May 30th, 727. After the chapel's consecration in 1889, Kinney decided to give his island shrine some historical significance. He wanted to recreate a chapel from the period that St. Hubert lived with a historic and artistic accuracy. In order to accomplish this task, Kinney hired a young artist from New York City by the name of Louis Comfort Tiffany. Louis Tiffany was the son of Charles Tiffany, founder of the famous Tiffany & Company. Not particularly interested in the family business, Louis Tiffany pursued an art career. He first studied painting under the guidance of George Innes, who was one of the Hudson River School masters. Later, in 1879, he established the firm of Associated Artists and began to pursue interior decorations. Tiffany is often credited with bringing stained glass production in the United States to its technical and artistic summit. In 1885, Tiffany established the firm of the Tiffany Glass Company. The Kinney Commission was the first fully integrated church interior executed by the Tiffany Glass Company and one of the first uses of mosaics in an ecclesiastical setting. St. Hubert's Chapel was a miniature proving ground and the genesis of many of the artworks that Tiffany would later employ in his church interiors throughout his career. St. Hubert's Chapel utilized all forms of decoration including a jeweled window, mosaic floor, marble and stained glass mosaic altar, sculpted memorial tablet, bronze metalwork, vestments, and plaster sculpture. After the Kinney Commission, Tiffany's ecclesiastical business flourished. 
In the ensuing decade, Tiffany's firms created numerous other church interiors. In addition, thousands of stained glass windows were installed throughout the United States. Sadly, less than 10 of these integrated interiors still exist. Today, Tiffany is best known for his fancy goods, art glass and lamps. Tiffany artworks command great attention and can be found in prominent museums throughout the world. Examples of Tiffany artwork can be found in the Corning Museum of Glass, Corning, New York, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, and the Neustadt Collection of Tiffany Glass, Queens, New York. Perhaps the largest collection of Tiffany artwork, including his famous exposition chapel, can be found at the Morse Museum of Art, Winter Park, Florida. According to an 1892 New York Tribune article, in order to carry out Kinney's plan for a historically accurate 7th century chapel, Tiffany assembled a team of artists and antiquarians and spent three years researching the life and times of St. Hubert in the museums and cathedrals of Europe. Mr. Tiffany, being a very good salesman, convinced Mr. Kinney that the chapel would be incomplete without a Tiffany window. It was at this point that the original building was enlarged. The entry, baptistry, and apse were designed and built. One could notice the distinct difference in the stonework. The older section of the chapel shows little artistic imagination in the selection and placing of the stone. The portions that Tiffany added to the chapel, the entry, baptistry, and apse utilized cut and faced stone. The stones were color matched to provide greater symmetry. Today access to the chapel island can only be achieved by a short boat ride. As one approaches the island, the modern boat dock can be seen on the south side of Chapel Island. This is the main departure point for chapel tours. A bluestone walkway leads from the dock to the chapel's entry. One of the major design elements of the southern facade is Tiffany's large oak door, studded with cast bronze hardware. The door was restored in 2003. The process included removing all the original hardware, recasting about 300 bronze nails, and replacing all the wood in kind utilizing old growth quarter sewn oak. Moving to the right, the eastern facade can be observed. The Tiffany Celtic cross as well as the Tiffany memorial tablet can be seen. The tablet depicts St. Hubert with his hunting hound. The Tiffany team incorporated designs that were copied from 7th century artifacts. On the lower left, the image of the deer with the crucifix can be seen. On the border of the tablet, in an ancient 7th century type style, the history of St. Hubert is written in Latin. Above the hunting hound on the right, in English, it reads 1889, Feast of Saints Christianus and Daria. On this day was dedicated to Almighty God under the patronage of St. Hubert. The Chapel of Kinelon by the Reverend W. M. Wigger, Bishop of Nork, assisted by the Reverend James B. McGrath, Reverend James Doherty, D.D., Carl Coleman. Patron Francis S. Kinney, Patroness Mrs. Francis S. Kinney, Joel Kinney, Beatrice Kinney, Warren Kinney. On the lower right, the tablet is signed, modeled by J.A. Holzer, New York, February 20th, 1890. Upon entering the chapel, the visitor will first note the marble mosaic floor. This was also designed and installed by the Tiffany Glass Company. The patterns were copied from Roman ruins that date back to the period of St. Hubert. The floor is a masterpiece and is the only artwork inside the chapel that was signed with the Tiffany Glass Company logo. As one moves into the baptistry, the interior of the Tiffany Celtic cross window can be seen. The symbolism at the bottom represents the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The four symbols at the top, the eagle, ox, lion, and man, represent the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This window is filled with hundreds of pieces of thick glass, fractured off so as to reflect the light and add to the brilliance of this window. 
Some of the glass chunks are three inches thick. The glass in the individual scenes was so selected to be viewed from either the interior or the exterior. This Tiffany masterpiece suffered some degree of vandalism. However, the window was also failing from its own weight. In 1994, the window was carefully removed from the chapel and underwent an extensive 10-month restoration, which repaired the broken glass and stabilized the window's weight. An exterior protective glazing was added at this time. Below the Celtic cross window, on this semicircular stone, was a large statue of the Madonna and Child. The figure was sculpted by Gustave Doré and displayed the Paris Salon in 1880, where it earned a third place award for sculpture. It was cast in bronze by the T-Bolt foundries. It is very likely that Tiffany purchased the figure for Mr. Kinney. The statue was removed from the chapel in 1948 at the request of the heirs of Morris Kinney and donated to St. Mary's Help of Christians Church, Aiken, South Carolina, by Beatrice Kinney LaMontagne. The figure has remained in the South Carolina church ever since. The bronze statue was obviously part of the original Tiffany design because the pattern in the mosaic floor follows the pattern of the stone pedestal. The large angel figure, titled the Angel of Resurrection, is also a prominent feature in this space. It was sculpted in Italy by Antonio Tantardini and was not part of the original design. This small alcove was the last addition to the chapel and was enlarged to house this figure in 1904. The stone on the base is inscribed in memory of Mary Cogswell, widow of Franklin Sherwood Kinney, died Washington, D.C., April 7, 1877. This figure removed from grave, Oak Hill Cemetery, Washington, D.C., and brought to this chapel for its better protection, August 20, 1904. Mary Cogswell Kinney was very prominent in Washington, D.C., and had a residence there for a good part of her life. Mary and her sister Elizabeth Cogswell Dixon were very good friends of Mary Lincoln. On that dark night when President Lincoln was shot, Mary Cogswell Kinney and her sister Elizabeth Cogswell Dixon and Mary Kinney's daughter, Constance Kinney, were among the only five women who saw President Lincoln after he was shot but before he died. All those who saw the president that night were captured in a famous painting, The Last Hours of Lincoln, by artist Alonzo Chappelle. Chappelle used Civil War photographer Matthew Brady to photograph all the subjects and incorporated their likenesses into the painting. Later, in the mid-1870s, Harper's Weekly printed the painting along with a key as to whom all the subjects were. On the wall opposite the Celtic cross, the holy water font was installed as a large clamshell surrounded by abalone. Turning to the right, one enters the sanctuary of the chapel. This was the original part of the building. Upon entering the sanctuary, to the left is a large fireplace, big enough to roll a huge log into. This was the only means of heating the chapel. Above the fireplace sits a hammered brass scene depicting St. Hubert with his hunting hounds kneeling before the stag with the crucifix between its antlers. It was created in the early 1900s and was purchased from an antiquities dealer in Spain. Previously, a plaster relief supplied by William Gibson Sons was situated within a recess above the fireplace. The original hunting scene showed St. Hubert in the forest chasing the stag. There are eight windows in the sanctuary that depict the life of St. Hubert. Prior to hiring Tiffany, Kinney purchased these eight original windows from William Gibson Sons of New York City. William Gibson is often credited with opening the first stained glass company in the United States about 1833 and is sometimes referred to as the father of stained glass painting in America. Although many of the original windows were destroyed by vandalism, they have all been exactly reproduced and or restored and reinstalled in the chapel with a protective exterior glazing. The eight windows tell the story of the life and conversion of St. Hubert. 
The windows in the rear of the church depict St. Hubert before he converted. Above the original entrance door, a transom window depicts the symbol of St. Hubert, the stag's head, with the Holy Cross between its antlers. The windows behind the altar depict the vision of St. Hubert. These windows were designed after a 1503 engraving by Albrecht Dewar. The window to the left of the altar depicts St. Hubert after his conversion when he becomes Bishop of Liège. The chapel's altar was another Tiffany masterpiece. It consists of geometric glass mosaics on the sides and rear. Thousands of small stained glass squares, called tesserae, were cut and then gold leafed on the reverse side and then set into cement to form these intricate mosaics. On the lower front, an elaborate relief with hundreds of gilt glass jewels was set into a background of gilt amber glass. The symbols of the four evangelists surround the center medallion. The decorative plaster filigree is gilt as well. A pink marble border, carved with a cross and deer antlers, supports the altar's retable. On the retable is the tabernacle. Behind a decorative gilt plaster door, encrusted with glass jewels, a small safe was installed to protect the holy vessels. On either side are a series of six mosaics. The upper two have the symbol for the Alpha and the Omega. The lower four mosaics requote the scripture of John 6, 51 in Latin, I am the living bread who from heaven descended. Above the altar was a Tiffany sanctuary lamp fashioned after the Visigoth votive crowns of the seventh century. The lamp was stolen and discarded by vandals many years ago. Fortunately, some of the crown's parts have been recovered and an effort is underway to restore this important Tiffany artwork. To the right of the altar, is a small space that served the dual purpose of sacristy and confessional. The wooden pegs were used to store the vestments, which were also supplied by Tiffany. Regrettably, none of these vestments have survived. A long hinged desktop where a priest would prepare the host for service can swing down to allow space for the efficient to receive confession. Also along the right side, an oak facade with carved cherubs and a large carved oak deer with spray and cross can be seen. This facade was designed to conceal a pump organ. Above the oak facade, in full plaster relief, Tiffany supplied five statues of saints, whom like St. Hubert, converted to Christianity by virtue of their sports. Set against a background of trees and foliage, some of which extend onto the oak ceiling, were depicted St. Germanus, St. Eustace, St. Hubert, and St. Zeno. In the center was depicted St. Michael, the Archangel, the Grand Hunter of Heaven, who drove the wild beasts out of paradise. During the early 1960s, many of the statues were destroyed by vandalism. Research is presently being conducted to restore this section of the chapel. A painting of the original design by J.A. Holzer, who was a very prominent artist in the Tiffany organization, was recently discovered in a museum in Bern, Switzerland. Under the stag's head is a small latticed screen door. Beyond this, another door leads into the clock tower. This section of the chapel is not allowed to be accessed for safety concerns. An iron circular staircase ascends about 20 feet to a platform above which are the chapel's chimes. The three large bronze bells were cast in Baltimore by the McShane Bell Foundry. There is no opening in the clock tower big enough to bring these bells through. It means that the bells were mounted onto huge oak beams and lowered into place while the clock tower was being constructed. Then the stonework was continued. The circular staircase continues up another 15 feet to a small trap door. This leads into the clock room. The chapel's clock was manufactured by E. Howard & Company, Boston, one of the most prestigious clockmakers of the period. Powered by weights, the clock would strike the hour and the quarter hour on the chimes below. 
The clock is still a manual wine tower clock. A volunteer travels to the chapel once a week throughout the summer to wind the clock. The quarter hour chime is now only engaged for special occasions. The clock was restored in 1974. The Kinney family used the chapel when they were in residence on the Kinnelon estate. Log books kept by Francis Kinney reveal the family nature of the chapel. Morris Kinney, the youngest of Francis and Mary's four children, was baptized in the chapel in 1891. Mary Brady Kinney died in 1898 at the age of 39. When Francis Kinney passed away a decade later, the Kinnelon estate passed to Morris and Warren Kinney. Together, the brothers continued to raise poultry and livestock, including champion brown Swiss cattle and champion old English sheepdogs on their estate. Warren and Morris both served as commissioned officers during World War I and afterwards were largely responsible for the creation of Kinnelon Borough, which separated from Pequannock Township in 1922. Warren Kinney became the first mayor of the borough of Kinnelon. At that time, the new borough took the name of the Kinney Estate, Kinnelon, as a tribute to Francis Kinney. The two brothers then renamed their estate Stillwater, but after some confusion with the town of Stillwater, later changed the name of their state to Smoke Rise. The name Smoke Rise is believed to have its origins from the Native Americans and can be found in land deeds dating back to the early 1800s. In 1924, Warren Kinney, seeking better schools for his children, sold his share of the estate to his younger brother, Morris. Warren then moved to New Vernon, Morris County, New Jersey, and lived there on Lees Hill Farm for the remainder of his life. Warren Kinney continued to raise the champion Brown Swiss herd that his father, Francis, established at Kinnelon in 1890. He was also a major participant in the effort to preserve the Great Swamp National Refuge in Morris County, New Jersey. Warren Kinney passed away in 1975. In 1926, Morris decided to take an extensive world tour. He sold off the entire kennel of Old English Sheepdogs and essentially closed down the estate. The trip lasted five years from 1927 to 1932. Morris traveled extensively throughout Europe, India, Africa, and the Far East. During this time, the chapel was no longer in use. In the early 1930s, a mission was sent out from St. Anthony's Monastery to recover the sacred vessels and altar stone from the chapel. Upon Morris Kinney's return in 1932, he decided to tear down the unwieldy cottage. In November 1933, the old massive cottage was systematically disassembled. Some of the old windows and lumber were donated by Morris Kinney to build Kinnelon's first firehouse. The stone from the 13 massive chimneys was utilized to build the new 17-room Cotswold-style mansion, complete with central heat and electricity, on the foundations of the original cottage. It took two years to complete the construction at a cost of $85,000. Morris Kinney contributed extensively to the general welfare of the newly formed Kinnelon Borough. In the mid-1930s, he held water contests on his estate to raise funds for the newly formed Kinnelon Fire Company.
Later, he installed the first plantings around the public buildings to help beautify the fledgling borough and instituted garden contests to further enhance the beauty of Kinelon. Morris Kinney continued to live on the estate for the rest of his life, while the rare Tiffany Chapel sat quietly undisturbed in its original setting. He passed away in October 1945. At the time of his death, he bequeathed the entire estate, the manor house, and the 29 outbuildings, including St. Hubert's Chapel, to his lifelong friend, John Alden Talbot. In early 1946, John Talbot Sr., with great foresight, decided to subdivide the 5,000-acre estate into a planned unit development with large lots ranging from one and a half to six acres with larger than average homes. In July 1946, Talbot created the Smoke Rise Company, which oversaw the development. Talbot wanted to preserve the natural character of the land and insisted every home must fit into its natural surroundings. No two homes were to be built identically. The original plan envisioned 1,500 homes dispersed over the 5,000 acres with plenty of land set aside for recreation and social activities. The original plan also envisioned a self-contained village shopping area. In July 1947, Talbot converted the old stone barn into a village inn to serve the new community as an inn, restaurant, bar, and community center. It still serves some of these functions today. Talbot also founded the Smoke Rise Club in 1946, a not-for-profit homeowners association which would oversee the social and recreational needs of his proposed new community. Road construction began in the winter of 1946. By the spring of 1947, a sales campaign and advertising began to promote the new development. By 1951, over 75 homes were occupied. Some of the earliest residents requested permission to use St. Hubert's Chapel as a place of worship. At the time, there were no other churches in Kinalon Borough. This was the origin of the Community Church of Smoke Rise. The chapel had not been used for over 25 years. The women of Smoke Rise cleaned the chapel. The roof was repaired and the tower clock was put back into working order. The first service was held on July 1st, 1951. Over 75 patrons attended. Worshippers would travel to the chapel in rowboats, canoes, and two longboats that Morris Kinney imported from India in 1932. As the summer services became more popular, the chapel was filled to capacity. Chairs were set up outside and a generator and loudspeaker were set up on the island to broadcast the services. The chapel continued to be used as a place of worship during the summer months in 1951 and 1952. However, after a sudden summer thunderstorm challenged the worshipers, it was decided to abandon using the chapel for regular weekly services. The last ceremony, a dual christening, was held in September 1952. Shelton Smoke and Franklin Smith were the last two infants christened in the chapel. It would be 45 years before another christening ceremony would take place at St. Hubert's Chapel. Once again, the tiny chapel, lavishly decorated by the Tiffany Glass Company, stood idle and undisturbed. 
the peaceful sanctity would not last long. In 1957, teenage vandals broke into the chapel and destroyed and looted its precious Tiffany-designed interior. A long period of neglect followed. Several efforts were made in the early and mid-1960s to reverse the destructive trend. However, the theft and vandalism continued. Birds gained access through the broken windows and the priceless Tiffany Chapel became an abandoned, dirty, and ruined artifact. If meaningful actions were not undertaken, the chapel would surely have faced complete destruction. In 1969, 13-year-old Thomas Klein proposed a chapel cleanup project to his Boy Scout troop. Permission was quickly obtained from John Talbot Jr., who owned the chapel at this time. The scouts boarded up broken windows and cleaned out years of bird manure. Then Tom Klein began a lifelong effort to restore the chapel to its original condition. During the early years, Klein restored the tower clock, replaced the roof over the chapel, secured various chapel elements, repaired woodwork, and countless other projects to preserve and protect the fragile structure. Today, almost 50 years later, Mr. Klein is still involved with the chapel's restoration and serves as lead conservator for the chapel project. In 1991, Kinalon Heritage Conservation Society, Inc. was formed to protect open space and historic structures in the borough of Kinalon. Kinalon Heritage has been one of the leading supporters of the chapel restoration project. Through the ensuing years, Kinalon Heritage has sponsored a number of restoration projects, starting with replacement of the roofs in 1992. Later, Kinalon Heritage supported the restoration of the entrance door the Celtic cross window, the original eight stained glass windows, the interior woodwork, and the Tiffany altar. There is still work to be done to complete the restoration and Kinalon Heritage is committed to seeing the restoration process continue. In time, the once precious Tiffany design chapel will be completely restored to its original appearance. We hope you have enjoyed this online tour of St. Hubert's Chapel. Please direct any comments or suggestions to Kinalon Heritage Conservation Society, Inc. via our email, which can be found on the website, kinalonheritage.org. This film was made possible by a grant administered by the Morris County Heritage Commission for the Morris County Board of Chosen Freeholders. The grant was funded by the New Jersey Historical Commission, a division of the New Jersey Department of State. Copies of this presentation are available on DVD. For information, please visit our website at kinelonheritage.org.